Welcome back. So in this segment, I want to speak briefly about how neurons send signals. And it turns out that the mechanism the mechanisms that neurons use differ within the neuron and between neurons. So within the neuron, information is sent via the action potential. And the action potential is just a difference in the electrical charge on the inside of the uh, neuron's axon and the outside of the neuron's axon. Uh, that creates an electrical potential that sort of rides down the length of the axon. And it's uh, created by ions, sodium and potassium ions, um, moving in and out of the membrane of the axon. So uh, this slide now that you're seeing shows the different stages of an action potential. And, and basically what I want you to get out of this is that there are little ions rushing in and out via these uh, gates that open and close um, in the membrane of an axon. So when the axon's not doing anything, it turns out that it has, um, that action potentials have um, a, a potential that's negative. It's negative minus uh, 70 millivolts. So neurons just hanging around. Then the cell body decides to fire an action potential. See, so action potential comes down starts down the length of the axon, and what happens? Well, the axon becomes depolarized, which means it's not so negative anymore. In fact, it becomes positive, um, goes up to positive uh, 40 millivolts. And that positivity comes from uh, positive sodium ions rushing in um, to change the membrane potential. So we've got the electrical... What was negative becomes positive, and then the signal passes on, and then what happens? Well, uh, the signal, um, the membrane becomes repolarized, or it becomes negative again. Um, and that happens when positive uh, potassium ions leave the membrane. Uh, that happens when positive potassium ions um, leave the membrane. So started out negative, went positive, now it's going back negative. And in fact, it goes so negative that you see in the next slide that it reaches a state of hyperpolarization, becomes even more negative. Um, the axon uh, cannot, or the cell body cannot send uh, uh, another action potential during this hyperpolarization. It's like the, the, imagine the axon is recovering so that it gets back to its um, resting state. Um, so here's the thing about action potentials that I want you to understand. Um, the action potential, the, the, it, it, nothing physically travels, no, no ions or, or um, no ions travel down the length of an axon when an action potential is being fired. What, ha what happens is just local. You've got um, positive and negative ions moving around, and that's changing the electrical potential of the membrane of the axon. So uh, the analogy that I like to use is the wave. Um, if you've ever watched a sporting event that occurs in a big coliseum, um, sometimes when the spectators are, want to amuse themselves, they'll do a wave. So they'll um, uh, um, sequentially raise their hands or, or stand up and sit down, um, and so no person actually leaves their seat. They could just stand up and sit down. But that energy gets passed all the way around the um, Colosseum. So that's an action potential. Uh, scientists like to or commonly record the electrical activity of the neurons because that's how they think neurons communicate information. And a lot of times you'll see... Uh, displays like this one with these little line segments. And every time there's a little notch or, or a vertical line segment, that means an, that the cell that's being recorded has fired an action potential. So when you see a lot of lines, that means you're looking at a neuron that's very, very active. Um, if you see very few lines, then um, you're looking at a cell that's not particularly active. Okay, that's along the, the length of an axon.
What happens at the end of the axon, in the axon terminal? How is information communicated between neurons? So it turns out uh, that neurons don't actually touch each other. There's a, there's a gap between them. It took scientists a long time to figure that out. And that gap we call a synapse. Um, and what happens in the synapse is that information is no longer communicated by a, an electrical potential, but rather by the movement of chemicals. So what happens when an action potential gets down to the um, end or axon terminal, uh, neurotransmitters are pushed down to the edge, the very ending point or the cliff, if you will, of that neuron, and those neurotransmitters are dumped into that gap, that sort of soupy gap. And some of them float around and migrate and come in contact with the, the downstream neurons, if you will. And those neurons have receptors of different shapes. You can imagine a, a baseball glove or one of those children's toys where you could have a, you know, round pegs and triangular pegs and round holes and, and square holes. Some of the receptors are shaped so that the neurotransmitter fits in them. And when that occurs, then that um, dendrite sends a signal to the cell body of that neuron. So the transmission becomes chemical and it depends on sort of a, a, a lock and key mechanism. It depends on spatial compatibility. Now it turns out there are a lot of different kinds of neurotransmitters, over a hundred. You don't need to know them for this class, but I just want to talk about uh, some of the fun ones. Um, well, here's one that's not so fun, but it's important. Dopamine is a, is a profoundly important uh, neurotransmitter. It's used in lots of different parts of the brain, and it's involved in all sorts of things, from Parkinson's disease to schizophrenia to addiction. Um, in Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease results from the death of the part of the brain that produces dopamine. Um, and without that dopamine, the body has trouble controlling um, the movements of the limbs. Muscle rigidity and tremor set in. Um, in addiction, um, increased dopamine um, makes uh, certain external stimuli, like alcohol or your drug of choice, uh, very attractive and feel very rewarding. In schizophrenia, there is, um, uh, schizophrenia is thought to depend on an excess of dopamine that triggers uh, hallucinations and other types of disconnection um, with reality. Um, a fun neurotransmitter is uh, endorphins. Um, endorphins are released um, uh, during a runner's high. So if somebody's running a marathon and they just feel like death, and there's a certain point where they hit a wall, and then after that point, if they keep going, if they keep running through the pain, they start to feel good. That's a runner's high. It comes from endorphins. Endorphins are released um, when you eat your favorite food, maybe chocolate ice cream, you get a rush of pleasure from endorphins. Orgasms involve a rush of endorphins. Um, laughter is associated with endorphins. Uh, so is acupuncture. So endorphins work by um, blocking uh, another neurotransmitter that's involved in the transmission of information related to pain. So you can think of endorphins as sort of blocking pain signals. Um, morphine, opiates, fentanyl, these all work on the endorphin system. Um, since we're in California, where there's legalized marijuana, uh, I'll tell you about a, a neurotransmitter substance that's, um, I think, starting to be studied seriously, and those are cannabinoids. Um, and cannabinoids are chemicals that are naturally occurring in your brain. Uh, neurons have receptors that are uh, sensitive to these naturally occurring cannabinoids. Um, and uh, cannabinoids work by inhibiting uh, 
neurotransmitters. So it sort of is, slows down neurotransmitter release. And the best known cannabinoid is THC. THC is a psychoactive drug in marijuana, pot. Um, there's also CBD and there are a number of other um, cannabinoids that are um, in the marijuana plant and, and produced. Um, uh, some of these other um, chemicals don't have as much psychoactive activity, um, at least in terms of intoxication, but researchers are trying to figure out um, exactly what cannabinoids do. Um, receptors for cannabinoids can be found all over the body. Um, they, uh, THC and cannabinoids affect how your perception of pain, and some people use uh, THC to manage pain, THC and CBD. Um, someone who's used pot might tell you that they get the munchies. Well, it turns out that uh, cannabinoids uh, impact um, your experience of hunger and mood and even your response times. So there's a quick review of how neurons communicate information within their own neural bodies and to other neural bodies. Come back and we'll talk about the cortex.